it's one week of my life that turned into the most important thing I ever did. It was all about the joy of discovery and exploration. I thought, wow, this really relates to people. Curious by nature, creative by default, responsible for technology breakthroughs, unknown. Some people really deserve more credit. There are fascinating people behind the innovations that revolutionized our lives. Computer scientists, internet architects, programmers, digital designers. They don't usually get a lot of time in the spotlight. It's the billionaire CEOs that get all the attention. It's high time we paid tribute to those software pioneers. This year, we present to you eight stories of hidden heroes who dared to think big, but gained little credit. Some ideas never really took off as a business, but they paved the way for the future. And today, we're living in that future. We need to pay our respects to the heroes behind those ideas. Get ready for a new story each month, written by Stephen Johnson and brought to you by NetGuru. Hello and welcome to another chat with Hidden Heroes by NetGuru. Uh, the Hidden Hero Project is a tribute to people who shaped the technology, who built the foundation for modern digital world. My name is Maciej Makiewicz and I'm cybersecurity lead in NetGuru and I will be hosting a panel discussion for our great experts who built tools and basically the foundation for keeping all our online presence private and secure, to keep our data secure. Let me introduce my uh, guests. First, uh, first of our guests, uh, guests uh, Philip Zimmerman, computer scientist, cryptographer, peace activist, uh, who is best known for as the creator of the pretty good privacy PGP, uh, the email encryption software that remains the most popular method of encrypting emails. Hello, Philip. Hello. Uh, let me introduce my uh, second guest, uh, Martin Hellman, cryptologist, best known for co-inventing public key cryptography, a concept which is based for many security related technologies like uh, secure software updates, uh, secure uh, encryption, uh, communication encryption, and uh, and even a blockchain technology and digital currencies. Uh, that it protects it literally trillion of dollars in financial transactions at the, on daily basis. His work was recognized by ACM uh, Turing Award, sometimes called the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. Hello and welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, our third guest, Vincent, uh, Vincent Ryman, uh, a cryptographer who co-created a Rindal algorithm, which, is, uh, which in uh, October 2000 was selected by National Institute of Standard and Technology to become Advanced Encryption Standard uh, AES, AES, currently the most widely used symmetric encryption method in the world. AES is responsible for protecting the security and privacy of billions of people in the internet and basically in the IT world. Hello, Vincent. Hello. And the last but not least, uh, Mark Kerfee, an advocate for open source software and the founder of uh, Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, the largest nonprofit and online community in the field of software security that aims to keep the, us secure and the, in the internet. Uh, he spent the last 20 years building data security tools at Global Bank, Microsoft, and also three startups that he has founded. Hello, Mark. Good afternoon. Uh, okay, so let's begin. Uh, today, uh, we will talk uh, about challenges regarding the privacy in the internet, uh, and we'll try to answer the question, is the fight for online pri privacy lost battle, or we can something to do to increase the, our privacy. Uh, the agenda for today uh, is uh, we will, that we will start with uh, a little bit of history 
uh, then we will, uh, do, we will try to analyze the present day and challenges regarding the privacy in, in, in present day. And then we will talk a little bit about the future. Okay, so let's go, uh, let's start and let's go back in time for a while. In the early days uh, of the internet era, um, co complex encryption schemes were mostly reserved and used by national government, national uh, agencies, governments, military institutions, uh, and later on for corporations that had secrets that need to be protected. Most ordinary people had no need for using the ciphers in their, in their lives. Martin, could you tell us a little bit more how communication looked back then and what was the incentive to start the work on creating uh, basics for uh, public key cryptography and what were the biggest concerns regarding the encryption method back then? Sure, I'd uh, be happy to. Uh, first of all, in uh, 1963, 1964, when I took my first pro programming course, uh, communication was walking a deck of punch cards to a mainframe computer waiting 24 hours to get the printout. Uh, but by uh, the 1970s, we were already using uh, modems. And actually, uh, there were a few key things that got me interested in cryptography, although I have to say that a muse whispered in my ear, and that's maybe more than just a joke. Uh, I think the fact that uh, calculus occurred to Leibniz and, uh, um, oh goodness, Ga uh, Newton about the same time, uh, and public key cryptography occurred to Whit and me here at Stanford with Diffie and Ralph Merkel, who's another really hidden hero of cryptography at uh, Berkeley about the same time is an indication. But the three, th key, the three key things were uh, um, uh, David Kahn's book, The Code Breakers, coming out uh, in 1968, if I remember. Uh, 1969, I went to MIT and, oh, I was at IBM, 68 to 69, and they had just hired Horst Feistel, who I got to know, and I could see IBM investing money in, uh, in crypt commercial encryption, so that helped. And then the really key thing was when I was at MIT, 1969 to 1971, as an assistant professor, Peter Elias connect, gave me a paper by Claude Shannon connecting cryptography to information theory, which is what I'd done my PhD in. Um, the other thing is uh, we had email in the... Uh, uh, at Stanford University and a few other places very early. So uh, uh, we, we didn't have it in 1976 when uh, Witt and I came up with uh, what's now called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. But uh, uh, we, th we were seeing the computer communications revolution on the horizon. Uh, anything else that you'd like? Or is that uh, enough of a, an answer? Uh, great. Basically, uh, the, the, my uh, my key question was, what was the incentive to to create that? So you you tell uh, you oh. told me that, yep, yeah. And I could foresee this was a little later, about 1980. I remember saying, I can foresee the day when you might buy a loaf of bread with an electronic funds transfer, which in those days were often multi million dollar transactions. Uh, and here we're talking about you know a dollar or two. Uh, and uh, what happens, I said, if it's not protected, uh, even if someone can't steal the money, they can crash the system. So uh, there was some foresight uh, on our part, I'd say, and partly because we were at places like, in my case, Stanford University, where we were seeing the early uh, expressions of computer communications, the early expressions of the Internet, of, of commu computer communications, really. Okay, so as I understand that correctly, uh, the, the key motivation here was to... to, to... Uh, protect the, the the commercial part of the of the uh, communication channel, right? Right. And one other thing that happened was the federal government came out with the data encryption standard, the forerunner to AES that uh, Vincent uh, uh, designed uh, in 1975. It was announced, and it wasn't adequately secure. And so Phil was also involved in this. Uh, we could see that there was nobody in the government representing the public's interest. So I made myself a, a self-appointed security officer for the public in those days. Oh, that, 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 interest, that, that is very, really interesting. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next question. Philip, could you tell us a little bit more when it started to change um, and what was the trigger to, to create the PGP? Uh, what was the, your, your story regarding the changing way of thinking about the privacy where where you where you try to protect privacy of ordinary people 
<laughs> well, um, I noticed the absence of any tools uh, that that could be used by ordinary people. Um, governments had uh, these tools because they had large numbers of, of uh, data security people working for them in their intel community. Uh, but ordinary people did not. And, and so I, I felt that there was a need to do something about this. And, and, and so there was this sort of uh, this Venn diagram of, of uh, uh, people who, who could write software, software engineers, had software engineering capabilities, mathematicians who understood uh, the, 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 you know, the, the mathematics of cryptography, and, um, and people that are, were sort of activists that are willing to put their, donate their time to try to change the world. And the, the intersection of these three circles um, was a pretty small uh, little triangle in the middle. And the, the population of that triangle was uh, maybe not much more than one. <laughs> and that was me. In fact, I wasn't even properly in the circle for the mathematicians because I, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an applied, you know, software engineer. But uh, there just weren't, there just weren't the, uh, dedicated activists who, who understood anything about cryptography and there weren't, and all the software engineers were busy earning a living. And so I just wanted to do something about it. I'd spent several years as an activist in the peace, uh, in the peace movement in the nuclear weapons freeze campaign of the 1980s. And I felt that there was a need for um, um, grassroots organizations and, and activists to protect themselves from their own government. So I thought that there was a need for, for PGP. So PGP so, started out as a human rights project. So, great. So uh, you felt that this is a real, a real threat uh, regarding the um, the government that may influence the privacy, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, also it's interesting to compare the world of today with that world back then, because today this Venn diagram would be completely different. There are zillions of people who are at who are in all three sets, or at least a couple, two of them. There's lots of really good protocols uh, around now. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of products that are strong products that do good that do good work. I mean, I wanted to do um, secure telephony before I wanted to do email, but I but I had to wait because the enabling technologies for secure telephony, namely widespread broadband, weren't there yet. So I had to do an email encryption first. So even though people know me as Mr. PGP, uh, my real passion was uh, being able to secure uh, human voice conversations. Okay, so uh, uh, it's true that we have a lot, a lot more uh, tools uh, in the present days um, to, to protect our privacy, but also uh, there is uh, more, uh, more threats and more uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, methods to to, uh, to to affect our privacy and our security. And uh, uh, jumping uh, again uh, back in time for a while, PGP uh, release triggered the first uh, Meyer, um, let's say, attempt to by the US government to limit the public and foreign nation access to cri cryptography. So, um, such attempts uh, were, were de defined as crypto wars. Um, and what were the other attempts to influence and weaken encryption standards? Uh, Philip, could you please tell us a bit, little bit more about that? Well, if you go back a decade earlier, there were efforts by um, NSA to limit uh, the publication of academic papers that had important uh, discoveries in them. And fortunately, um, for the most part, those, um, the, that struggle um, let academics prevail and publish their academic papers. OK. Um, so, but that, that was earlier. And, and as, as time went on, the, the, the NSA had to retreat you know, first they had to let academic papers be published, and then they had to let people write software. 
um, and um, and it, but it, but they held on for an entire decade of the 1990s of, of strong efforts by activists to try to get rid of the export controls. Even when they dropped the case against me, the export controls were still there for several more years until 2000. Uh, meanwhile, across the pond, the French had domestic controls, uh, but they also recognized that their, you know, they wanted to get the economic benefits of the internet, and they saw with some envy the economic benefits that the United States was enjoying because of the internet. So. They migrated away from their um, Minitel uh, product that they had deployed and, and went instead for the internet. And they recognized that if they wanted to have e-commerce, they're gonna need to relax their domestic controls on encryption. So uh, this, this led to, you know, on both sides of the pond, um, an effort to relax the export controls and domestic controls. Okay, but what what was the reason or what was the justification for uh, limiting the crypto uh, w w limiting and weakening uh, encryption standard? There, is there was any kind of well, the the governments of the world, uh, you know, particularly the Western allies, um, had learned from World War II that uh, the ability to decrypt uh, your enemies communication was absolutely pivotal. The Battle of Midway was decisively determined by our cryptanalytic capabilities. Um, of course, Bletchley Park was, uh, you know, breaking um, Enigma, and that was, you know, highly consequential. And so, um, and, and, and they were breaking other codes as well. And so this shaped the, the, the attitude that governments had toward strong cryptography. They felt that the outcome of World War II was highly influenced by uh, their cryptanalytic capabilities. And if somebody started deploying strong encryption that was much more resistant to cryptanalysis, then it could make the next war go in a different way. And, and so they were afraid of that. And so from pretty much the, the second half of the 20th century, they had a hegemony on you know, they, they kept a tight lid on the deployment of strong cryptography. And the, okay. the attitude that they had, had to, they, the rest of us, as the internet arrived in the 1990s, we, we were taking the position that, well, that's all well and good for World War II in the 1950s, but here we are in the modern era with the internet, we need to be able to use strong cryptography in order to have a complex society that, use, that depends heavily on the internet. Okay, so uh, basically we can uh, we can say that the justification for governments was to basically security. We need to weaken in the encryption to, to to for security of of, of uh, national security, right? So uh, next question for Mike. Actually, can I just let me interject something? It's interesting that you're right about NSA in the '90s still being uh, like with the clipper chip trying to control encryption. But more recently, ex-NSA directors have said the FBI is uh, wrong to try to limit, uh, to try to insert these back doors, or I'd call them front doors. And uh, Admiral Inman, who is the director of NSA, has reversed his position. So it's interesting that NSA is now uh, in support of strong encryption, at least so far as I can see. And that's partly because uh, if we have weak encryption, then our whole economy is vulnerable. That's true. Basically, th th this was my uh, s uh, next question for you, Martin, uh, to ask about your um, your opinion about what about limiting the uh, cryptography or limiting limiting the encryption, um, and what was the uh, opinion on this approach? So, thank you for jumping. Yeah. In. Well, so I'll, I'll add a little bit. Uh, um, NSA. I remember uh, uh, Admiral Inman, the director of NSA at the time. Uh, and it, let's see, first of all, NSA and Witt and I were fighting a battle in the papers, except it was never NSA. There's a joke that NSA doesn't stand for the National Security Agency. It stands for no such agency and never say anything. And so we were fighting with um, straw men that they were putting up, the National Bureau of Standards, uh, IBM. Uh, and so I was really uh, overjoyed in a way when I got a call from the director's office at NSA, I think it was in early 1978, 
uh, saying that Admiral Inman uh, was going to be in California. And if I was willing to meet with him, he'd, uh, he'd like to meet with me. So I jumped at the opportunity and that began a cautious um, uh, relationship that has since become a friendship, uh, which is really quite amazing. And so I don't have time to go into all the details, but anyone who wants to hear some more about this, uh, my wife and I wrote a book, uh, which is freely available as a PDF for my Stanford website. Just Google Hellman and Stanford and you'll see it at the top and search on Inman and you'll find it. Or I gave a talk uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago to the annual meeting of Nobel laureates, which is on my publications page. Um, uh, so if you go back to my publications page, look for 2019. And one of the key ideas there, in fact, that uh, people picked up on is friends are better than enemies, which is a really uh, important issue today with uh, uh, Russia having invaded Ukraine and the United States now help, trying to uh, go for regime change in Russia, potentially. This is a very dangerous situation and uh, all sides need to uh, do something different. Um, the one data point, let's, I don't know if you want to, should we leave that alone for now? Uh, we will uh, we will go back to the to, to the present day in in few minutes. So we'll okay, just... I'll stop there then. Thank you. So let's jump few years forward. Uh, Vincent, the next question is for you. Uh, what were the early days in the internet and the cryptography uh, in the Europe? How how did it differ from what was happening in the states at this time? So well. Um... Initially, we were we had a backlog compared to the United States, but then um, when it became clear that these export controls were going to stay for a while, European industry started to develop um, and to expand and basically um, sell crypto in many countries in the world that the United States didn't want to sell to. Um, so. For some reason, I think that the, the success of, I mean, for this reason, we can say that the success of cryptography in Europe is part, can partially be attributed to these export controls eh? because um, this took away a lot of competition for the, at that time, weaker European economy. So we can we can even say that the, the export controls were, were the, uh, was the uh, positive thing because it forced the world to compete in area of cryptography i guess yes i think we can say so so very positive side effect uh, next question for you is um, i mentioned that your work as is responsible for protecting a lot of data in the it world today uh, what what was your incentive to create Rindle, uh, which becomes uh, AES later? Could you also maybe please uh, very briefly explain what uh, AES is for a less technical audience? Um, okay, I'll try. So AES is what we call a block cipher. It means um, it's a very low level mathematical primitive, if you want, that just... Um, replaces blocks of text by other blocks of text in that sense it's, it's like a code book if you want where that spies used to carry in in, in the movies and when when they saw messages they had to replace some words by other words a block cipher is the electronic equivalent of that where you um, replace blocks of bits by other blocks under the influence of a key that you need to keep secret um, and when you develop such an electronic electronic codebook. Um, it's basically a, a computer algorithm and you want it to be fast. Uh, you want that it can run on all types of computers and chips and you want it to be secure. Um, and so um, I think I'm a bit younger than Phil and Martin at least. And so in the in the 90s when NIST announced that they were going to um, replace the desk by a new standard i was just a naive phd student doing research actually without much concern of, of the world outside my university room so i was just thrilled that there was this opportunity to um, yeah to participate to the real world eh? to see that some of your research could actually be used in practice uh, that was very amazing so together with with johan damen my colleague we we jumped at it and we actually never dreamed that um, 
we would win the competition, but we just participated for the fun of it. So uh, I guess uh, it was quite a bit, quite quite a success, let's say. Uh, yes, indeed, and it was a surprise for many people around here too. Yeah, that uh, because Belgium, I don't know, is a very small country in the world. Also, Belgians usually don't think very highly of themselves. So, yeah, many people here thought we were in for the joke. Yeah, but then, during the competition, we when we saw. Uh, advantages and disadvantages of other uh, submissions, we started to realize that actually uh, we stood a chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So congrats for, for, for your work. Can I just uh, add something? Uh, of course. The, it, I, I believe there was general agreement, and maybe the others can comment, that the Rindell algorithm was the best one submitted. And it was a very public approach. So it was not something where the government picked the weak one. You, you really did a great job. Thank you. Great. So, congrats. Yeah, uh, there, it's a, there's a real elegance and beauty to uh, the Rindal watch lifer. Uh, a lot of the other ones were based on, you know, like the Faisal network had been used in a lot of block ciphers, but um, but Rindal broke new ground and and it, and it did it in a very elegant way. Thank you. Great. Okay, so uh, let's fast forward for another few years. Um, the scale of the pri privacy uh, concern has grown as much as the amount of data, as much as complexity of internet, of the IT systems uh, in, in current days. Um, next uh, question goes to Mark. Uh, what uh, were the biggest ch changes in the cybersecurity security landscape over the last two decades? Yeah, sure. So in the 90s, I was formally educated in information security at Royal Holloway in the UK. So under Fred Piper and, and Henry Becker, um, and actually the three other panelists were responsible for a lot of uh, long assignments uh, during that course. Um, but I was somewhat horrified when I left academia and went into work for financial services institutions, particularly at the practices um, that were that were being used. They weren't the sort of things that I had learned, you know, sort of formal operating system models, Bell La Padula and things, and then sort of watched how people implemented operating systems at, at, at banks. And I found myself in San Francisco running software security, application security for Charles Schwab, um, large financial services company, 8 million accounts. We had a trillion dollars sat in a, in a mainframe at the back end. And what struck me was that we would wind up with people telling us that we had security issues. And fundamentally at the time, there were no best practices that have been published. Um, and what you would often find when these reports came in, there was someone sort of coming closely behind with a product that magically fixed these issues. Um, and so at the time when we, when we had one of these that actually got us into the Wall Street Journal, I was moderating a, a mailing list at the time in 2000. Communities were basically mailing lists and I was moderating a, a system mailing list of bug track, which was the big responsible disclosure list. And so simply posted onto that list, hey, you know, why doesn't someone publish a bunch of a bunch of guidance and got some feedback? That would be a great thing that would help a lot of people. So I went home for a weekend and wrote this first guide and said, hey, here it is on the internet. And and after that, that's you know, sort of stimulated a project which has now become OWASP, which is this very large community. And what you have to kind of understand is that back in those times, early 2000s, you know, 15 years before AWS, AWS was, you know, came 15 years later, um, you know, the iPhone wasn't out, so there's certainly no mobile trading. And, you know, people, people just really didn't understand how to build secure software. You had people that, we had this big rush to the web, um, yet, you know, most people didn't understand how to construct those systems, but with massive amounts of, of finance and, and, and things at stake. So that's really was really the genesis. And what you've seen now is that that technology, you know, de, of software development, we have multiple languages, we have cloud deployments, we have DevOps and, you know, pushing stuff super fast. So we've seen massive changes and continue to see it, um, particularly with, with, you know, people now with cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain, you know, being used for everything from, you know, ledgers for log files and, uh, and all sorts of, dare I say, crazy things. 
Okay, so as I understand that correctly, your motivation was uh, similar to Philip to bring basically the, the uh, security elements, security um, knowledge to the people to make it more open to, to, to the world and use it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's about transparency and about having, you know, a degree of, uh, of, of people to go and, and look at those things, much like great crypto algorithms. It's not based on the secrecy of the algorithm. It's based on, you know, the strength of, of the work. And, you know, if you can publish work and allow people to critique it and, and you wind up with a, with a common consensus that these are the right things to do, then it raises the tide for everyone. And, and that's what, you know, that open source project has been able to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, I, I will risk the statement that uh, making the uh, security standards more open to the community uh, also allow, allowed the uh, technology to, to uh, security related technology be in line and in sync with the fast, uh, fast growing the uh, IT world and IT security standards. It, it speed up uh, many things in the world. Uh, but Next question, what, what are three the biggest threats on average user uh, can face today from the cybersecurity perspective, uh, Mark? But my apologies, we actually had a fire alarm there and I had myself on mute. So could you just repeat the question, please? Uh, of course, uh, what, uh, what in your opinion are three the biggest threats for uh, average user face today regarding the privacy, regarding the cybersecurity perspective? Sure. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges is that we're all interacting with online services all the time. And those online services are interacting with each other. And it's very, very hard to understand, you know, the security practices behind those, those things. Every day we wind up with data breaches. Um, and so this level of trust that you have to, you know, place in things is, is incredibly hard. And you're always making those, those trade-offs. So who you're interacting with, um, you know, affects your life, you know, how what, the, the things that are facilities that are available to you, but making those decisions are, you know, incredibly hard. Like there's, you know, there's no sort of sort of mantra which says this is this is a good place to interact with and this isn't. The other challenge that we've got today is that marketing automation is is so sophisticated um, that all of this data is flowing through on the back ends. And, you know, just last week, I I put a tweet about about something and within two minutes it was showing up as a recommendation on youtube you know two to two different vendors within two minutes and so this data is is just pervasive and and absolutely everywhere and understanding you know what you share and where it is being shared is is really challenging we see things like gdpr which says hey you know be aware that we're going to take cookies and we're going to share it with you but the practices on the back end and and how all of this data flows is 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 just incredibly hard um, and I think now, as we move into new ways of, 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 of using money and thinking about cryptocurrencies, the complexity and the new players and, you know, all of that stuff just makes it incredibly hard for people to, you know, to know what we're doing. And, and, and so as, as de, you know, decentralized, you know, finance happens, um, I think we're going to, that, that complexity to the consumer is, is going to get even more. And so, you know, it's, it's just hard to figure out how to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have several threats that uh, basically may affect our privacy today. Uh, um, in my opinion, one of the threats or uh, is still the uh, kind of uh, surveillance surveillance because we have uh, we have a, a most common global network of communications is that in um, specific situation it is much easier to. Um, to to to, to uh, control, and uh, what I want to ask uh, is: uh, Has anything changed regarding the uh, in the field of the privacy since um, Edward Snowden's revelation concerning uh, NSA mass surveillance operation in 2013? Uh, what is your opinion on this? I would like to ask Martin on that. Uh, see, you're asking me, it would be better to ask one of the others because uh, my interest shifted about 40 years ago from uh, cybersecurity, which I still maintain a uh, some interest, but uh, to international security, nuclear weapons security. Uh, and so uh, the Snowden revelations, while I'm aware of them, other people can probably say answer that better. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
uh, so I will I will go back with this question to Phil. What do you think about that? Is uh, you're you're muted. I'm sorry, I was momentarily distracted. Um, which part of that? Uh, could you uh, could you please el el elaborate something uh, more about the uh, is anything changing in the field of uh, privacy of the uh, of the internet since Edward Snowden revelation concerning uh, NSA and mass surveillance operations? Well, I, I think that um, Snowden's revelations uh, got everybody in the standards community to tighten up their their standards to to not be so lax in you know supporting legacy algorithms and and just to you know to, to try to limit the the use of um, pervasive surveillance uh, not just protecting yourself against a, a determined opponent that's attacking you which is a very hard thing to do but to try to limit pervasive surveillance on an entire population and and so the standards that we have today are better than they were before Snowden did his revelations. Okay. Um, so everybody's more aware of it now, and every time we design something, we, you know, we're aware of, of that the threat model is is much more difficult than we used to think. Actually, there's something I will add uh, to that. Uh, it must have been 30 years ago, IEEE Spectrum called me and said, asked, what's the biggest unsolved problem in cryptography? And I said, lack of user awareness. And it's still a major issue. Uh, and the other thing is that there's a trade-off between this. So this is independent of Snowden. There's a trade-off between um, security and ease of use. And so I get uh, emails from my financial institutions all the time saying, your statement's available. Click here to see it they're basically training people to fall for phishing expeditions. And so uh, we really need to think about whether the uh, trade-off between uh, security and ease of use is where it should be. I think it, we need more security. Yeah, and, and to, add, to add to what Martin said, from a developer perspective, it's exactly the same. We have robust cryptography with communications between cloud services, et cetera, but essentially you're seeding the keys with an API key which get pushed into source code, get pushed into people's GitHub repos. And it's back to that, you know, key exchange problem. Like, you know, if you just give two people the keys and push them across the internet, like everything else is completely compromised. And so that education awareness around how, you know, starting secure communications just is, is not there for developers around how they trade, they trade those secrets to seed further things. Uh, so actually, you had a key point also. I think security is often an afterthought that people see a problem, they solve it without thinking about security, and uh, then trying to add security is very difficult. What I've argued for many years is that when you come up with a new product, you should, which is either secure or insecure, you should put secure or insecure in its definition. And imagine, for example, when the first cell phones came out in the 80s, uh, if they had big banners in Radio Shack and places like that, that said, buy your insecure cell phone here. And th the advantage of putting security in the definition is, which is what you were buying, the, the, the advantage of putting security in the definition is you have to make sure that you've added security in the very beginning when it's easy and much easier to add. Yeah, this awareness means that, you know, every every secure product that I've worked on, the biggest competitor was not other peer competitors, but rather the biggest competitor was nothing because the customers, they were most likely to use nothing, nothing. You know, the biggest competitor to PGP was nothing. Um, the, you know, my, my secure telephony products, the biggest competitor was not other secure telephony products. No, it was nothing. Uh, so how do you talk people into, you know, raising their awareness and, and using some form of encryption? So basically, uh, we can sum up this, uh, this part with the statement that the key uh, element of the cybersecurity world currently is the problem with the awareness and on any level from technical and non-technical people uh, and ordinary users, right? Yeah, if I may add to that, I always use yes. the analogy of physical car security. Um, at some point in time, car manufacturers agreed that um, they would assume that everyone wears a seatbelt. 
and they develop car security in the assumption that you wear the seat belt. Yeah? And if you don't wear the seat belt, then the car will not be secure for you. Eh? The, the airbags are designed in a way that if you're wearing a seat belt, they protect you and otherwise they can't. Eh? And at the same time, governments everywhere um, teach people wear your seat belt because that's where it starts. If you don't wear your seat belt, yeah, you, you will die in a car accident. And I think something similar we should try to achieve in, in uh, computer security is that we agree on some minimal investments that users have to do and developers know then where they can start and um, other people can train users towards that level. So actually your analogy to seatbelts is a good one, uh, Vincent. One of the, when I give talks to general audience on cryptography, I sometimes ask how many of you have used encryption and almost nobody raises their hand or nobody does. And then I ask how many of you have bought something on the internet with a credit card, done electronic banking, everybody raises their hand. And I point out you were using encryption. It was just integrated, automatic and transparent. And that's the way it should be. You don't even know you're using it because if you have to do something special, like put on a seatbelt. Uh, if you have to click something to get security, most people will not do it. And so we need integrated, automatic, transparent encryption, M much more of that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Vincent, you mentioned about the seatbelts and this decision will also support it by the, uh, by the regulations, by the law later on. And what do you think about the regulation uh, like GDPR, uh, California Customer Privacy Act or, or similar? Uh, will will it be effective? Do, what do you think about that? Is it a good uh, good path to start regulate the internet of privacy area in the current world? I think it was a fair attempt eh? because the underlying philosophy is that companies should stop just collecting massive massive amounts of data without really knowing if they would later need it or not, but just in case of, it's easier to collect all data now. And the, the regulation was an attempt to, to stop that. Of course, what we see now in practice is that whenever you visit a website, you have to click away 27 consent forms. Yeah, that's actually a step backwards because you train people to just click on random windows uh, and then that will damage security so but there was value in, in the attempt i think but but we'll need a a new version um to really fix the issue so in your opinion it's worth to try to with with the, another regulations or to improve the current ones yes but don't ask me on how it should look like huh? uh, of, of, of course it's, it's very complex thing and uh, i will not uh, asking you about that because it's very tricky, uh, but uh, still, um, it's good to know what is your opinion about that. And maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mark, you want to add something? What is your opinion? Should we go with the regulations or should we find better solution to implement? Well, so obviously, things like California Privacy Protection and GDPR provides a framework. Um, for people, you know, how can data be processed and and how can it be collected and what can it be, pro you know, collected for and provides that transparency back to the users. Um, and I know that, you know, lots of companies have a, a great friend as Chief Privacy Officer at Airbnb and the amount of effort they invest into ensuring that all of that um, is, is, is taken on board is, is tremendous. But at, the end, but at the end of the day, you know, privacy engineering isn't really a thing. When a developer builds a system, you know, it's not really well understood how the database is processing PII and how it's being communicated. And when the cloud architect, you know, configures that with a different system, how that type of data flows to someone else. So it's really kind of like a front door, right? And, and it's like, look, you know, here's what we're going to do with it. Trust us, that's the way it's going to be. And I think everyone in the security industry knows the dirty little secret that whilst there are breach laws, large amounts of the breaches never get reported. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a step forward for sure. It's, it's providing a, you know, a written or a verbal contract between how the company is going to process the data. But fundamentally, the technology doesn't exist behind in privacy engineering to make it easy to implement. And so to Martin's point, like until we, until we provide stuff that's essentially cookie cutter for developers, 
where privacy engineering is, you know, is a thing. It's not like now if I want to have a database, I've got to go and enable AES to encrypt it at rest. Then, you know, we're still faced with that um, essentially manual verbal contract between the user, and it's 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 unfortunately not being enforced. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, GDPR was basically one of the methods to limit the transfer of the data between corporations that that are currently uh, basically fueled by our privacy, by our data. And uh, what do you think about the effectiveness of work of the GDPR regarding the social media uh, field? Uh, <clears throat> you know. Uh... If you specialize in cryptography, you tend to think of um, privacy as being just uh, simply protecting information from disclosure by somebody intercepting some communication or something like that. And that's a very uh, direct sort of simple um, uh, attitude about privacy. But what we see today is the, this, this sort of pervasive indirect effects uh, if Facebook or, uh, or some other uh, social media is exploiting our metadata and observing our behavior and building a, a, a model of our behavior and using it as their revenue model to predict uh, what, we'll, what we'll be interested in and then showing us things that they think will in maximize engagement based on the model that they create by, you know, invading our privacy. Um, then you get this these you get effects that affect everybody even people that are not on social media and that is you turn society against itself nothing is nothing is drives engagement as much as uh outrage if people are angry uh then they will stay engaged they will they will hold the phone all day and 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 just obsessively read stuff and react and click buttons and do things. And, and that's what makes them money because they have an advertising model that exploits this model that they build from your behavior. And even though the, these algorithms are not specifically designed to tear civilization apart, that's the emergent property of these um, algorithms. And, and you end up with a, a society that is on the edge of civil war. You know, uh, you end up with people killing each other and, and turning against each other in ways that they've never done before in history. I think that, that social networks driven by these optimized algorithms for engagement are the biggest danger to, uh, to humanity, you know, since nuclear weapons. Um, I don't know. I don't know how we get out of this jam unless we can get the social network companies to stop doing this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to disagree with, this, uh, with those statements. Uh, but I want to jump uh, into the, 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 the last part of our discussion uh, to talk a little bit about the, the future. Um, what are the privacy challenges facing us in the future? We talked about the corporation, about social media, uh, about the threats from the governments, but on the horizon we have the, the, the cryptography revolution related to the quantum computing uh, and things like that. Um, what is your opinion about that? These quite open questions. I will. Uh, we, can, we can start with uh, with Vincent uh, regarding that, but uh, I want to um, uh, get your opinion uh, of about the, the, the future related to this. Um, let's say things that are coming for us. Okay. I'm what you could maybe call a, a quantum skeptic person in the sense that I think that um, we must take care that, yeah. Okay, let me give an example. When um, during the AES process, um, NIST stated, okay, that they plan I plan the key length of 128 bits for for the ciphers, um, but I also added a key length of 256 bits to be quantum secure. Yeah? So I doubled the key length. I said, in case quantum computers come into existence, we'll have a double key length. Yeah? Nowadays, if I talk to people, they ask me, um, 
yeah, they tell me we're using AES with 256 bits keys um, right now, but if quantum computers come, we'll want to we'll be using 512 bit keys. So doubling again. Yeah. Um, and that makes no sense uh, because the security was already added in the system. Uh, but people, uh, as soon as you say the word quantum, quantum, try to expand and expand and expand. Uh, and there are, of course, certain algorithms that we need to rethink, uh, many of them public key algorithms. But um, yeah, it's, it's not the main thing that we need to address now. And in many places, it has actually been included in the equation. So, um, so I think a lot of the fuss now is actually not needed. Okay, great. Great to know your opinion on that. And what about the, 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 the machine learning and uh, connection with the privacy? Mark, could you? Actually, let me, let me just add something there. Even if I also tend to be a, a quantum skeptic, but if quantum computing or some other a, a factoring a discrete algorithm breakthrough occurs 20, 30 years from now, the medical records of someone who's young today, or even me, even though I'll be dead at that point with high probability, should still be secret. So we, we it's not like we can wait until we know there's a problem. We need to be planning ahead of time. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's go back to the, my uh, sub question on that uh, about the future and uh, privacy. Uh, what about the machine learning and uh, things related with the uh, uh, machine learning regarding the privacy so, and security? Yeah. So, so Phil, you know, Phil described um, around the algorithms from social networks. I think is you know is is, is incredibly important. You know, what we've seen is. The more you get advertised to, you know, the more bifurcated it becomes. And so we've seen the rise of, you know, Trump and all these things. You know, if you're a if you're a Trump supporter, you get bombarded more more messages about how great Trump is. And if you're not, you know, you you, you get the opposite. And when we look at how all of this data science and machine learning is working, the more data we can put together, um, the more we can train our models, and then the results of those models get fed back in. And so this body of data, the more data we have you know, the better we, we are. And I say the better we are, the better those companies are at producing revenue. Um, and the incentive model is certainly not to reduce that data. The incentive model is to continue to compound it with, with other things. And so as we, we, we do more um, data science, and if we think about, you know, the, the models with cloud computing, you essentially have unbounded storage with, with Amazon that's dirt cheap. And so there's not even the barrier to end, barrier to, to doing it, which is an economic one. And so we're gonna to continue to see more and more of that. And, and that certainly makes the way that that PII privacy data being used is, is the incentive there and the barriers to stop you doing it are, are, are all fuggernal. Okay, thank you. Uh, the re the pretty, much last, pr pretty much last question from the audience. Uh, I have a question from uh, Pavel that will possibly s s uh, quite good summary for, for our discussion. Um, is any one-click one -click privacy solution for everyone uh, it, even possible? Who could help with it uh, if we have uh, governments or uh, corporations that are not interested in such effect? Is, is it some kind of possible to, to have uh, this kind of model of uh, privacy on one click? Uh, maybe, Phil, I will... Uh, ask you about that what do you think um yeah um in the old days with pgp there was a, a significant cognitive burden that you had to understand something about trust models and key certification and in the uh, you know in, in the early 90s anyone who was using email was by definition a power user uh, ordinary people did not use email um, email was not commonplace like it later became um, and so, uh, but if you look at what's available to us today, that cognitive burden has disappeared in a lot of cases. You know, if you, if you talk on, um, uh, let's say signal, for example, to make a phone call, or I have a product called silent phone, it's similar to signal, and you don't need to think about it. Um, it, you know, the, the trust model is not visible to you, or at least, you know, you, you don't need to think about it. And so it, it is in the spirit of this question, you know, one click privacy solution. I'm not sure you have to click. I mean, you, you know, you make a call and it's secure. 
So it is possible to do that. And I think that governments, it depends on which part of the government you ask them. I mean, the question here says, uh, government seem to not have interest in such effort. Well, I think they do. I think that, um, you know, there's a national security reason for all of us to be using end-to-end -end secure encryption. Maybe law enforcement doesn't like it, but, um, but intel agencies do, because the intel agencies, at least parts of intel agencies, are tasked with protecting the whole of society against foreign enemies who are trying to do signals intelligence. I mean, one of the problems we have right now is that Europe in particular has deployed, um, the telcos in Europe has deployed um, 5G infrastructure that was built by Huawei. Well, Huawei, you know, was was highly influenced by the Chinese military and intel agencies. And so that means that many European democracies are depending on network infrastructure that is controlled by a potential adversary that has, um, you know, uh, quite a lot more signals intelligence capabilities that, that emerged from the deployment of their equipment. And in that kind of environment, you would have to use end-to-end -end encryption. And it has to be something that doesn't have a high cognitive burden, not like PGP. Uh, you know, the power users of the early 90s were capable of recognizing what you have to do to use PGP. But today, most users of, you know, email it's too difficult to wrap your heads around the the, um, the trust model, but everybody can make a secure call on a signal or a silent phone or any of the, it's quite a few apps that allow you to talk securely. Apple FaceTime, for example, uses end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. And yet and yet, the, some of the Western democratic countries are pushing back against it. And I think it, they're shooting themselves in their foot by doing so, because they're undermining their own national security. I think that what's happening is that law enforcement agencies in those governments are having a little bit too much influence, and they should listen to their intel agencies, who are probably going to advocate stronger end-to-end -end encryption to protect the whole of society. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vincent, or maybe you want to add something about this topic in this question? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, it's not only Huawei who can be suspected of adding um, eavesdropping facilities to the, the... Since Snowden, we know that there is also American companies that uh, do the same in products that they sell to European governments. So I think the concern of Phil is valid, but it's, it's much more broad than just 5G products. It's basically in all type of software that we use, um, you you cannot really uh, you can be sure that there are governments in the world uh, backdooring it and getting after information. Yeah, and I think last year Bloomberg and Jordan Robertson, the journalist, published an expose where chip backdoors had been found in the supermicrochips, and uh, was proven with you know spectrum microscopy, and and uh, and so it's yeah. It's, uh, it's not just a Huawei problem, it's pretty pervasive, I think. The other point I would add is while law enforcement typically does want these days weak encryption or you know front doors, back doors, uh, it's in their interest also to prevent uh, crime. I mean, the cheapest form of law enforcement is crime prevention, not crime uh, solution. And so uh, there's a trade-off even in law enforcement between security uh, for the public and not. Okay, uh, thank you about your uh, about uh, about. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are run out of time. Mm, thank you uh, for our discussion here. It was our pleasure to meet you and talk with you. Uh, unfortunately, that is the end of this uh, the, the, this very interesting conversation uh, with you. Uh, Thank you uh, once, uh, once again uh, very much for the participating. And uh, summing up, uh, this live stream event was a part of the Hidden Hero Initiative. Um, each month we uh, publish a new story about the innovator who uh, discovers had a massive impact on our society. And tomorrow 
we are going uh, we are going live with the sixth uh, story uh, and check it out on the hiddenheroes.netguru.com. Thank you very much once again and see you there. Bye. Bye.